So Karen, what we're doing, we're kind of just starting off to check in with everyone, see how you're doing, where you're at, and kind of how you're like adapting to the new normal. Now you're in you're in New York City, right? Right. Yeah. It's uh, it's you know, the first few weeks we've actually just sort of like one of those just chill, calm down. You know, this is it's going to be like this for a while. Mm-hmm. And and you know, people in the biz started uh, in my you know theater biz like. Everybody's getting dingy. It's like, you know, we have to work on some of these projects. At least we could put them down on Zoom. Maybe we could do these readings of these new plays. And so now it's like. Now everyone's incredibly busy. Do Zoom musicals. I'm shooting tomorrow. Anyway, and then I'm doing another one another, another time. And then I'm doing a reading of a play in. At, uh, the end of June. But that's going to be pretty easy because we'll be like you know, sitting here and like we're talking here. But when you do these musicals, it's all about the, you know, get putting the. I did a curtains reunion uh, song that they're going to put up for the Actors Fund. I mean. I, and these are actually for public consumption. This isn't. Wow. Yeah, this is very <laughs> <laughs> So, Karen, this last, last, last summer you were singing with us. With the yes. symphony, the pops. I uh, wonderful, just wonderful. That was a great experience, and you, and if I remember correctly, you sang the original arrangement of "Over the Rainbow." Oh, it was Mike, Michael managed to find the original arrangement, which nobody had, and uh, we got to do it with your fantastic chops. What is the original arrangement? It's it's just the the figures we're used to hearing from the movie, but it had long been lost. But Michael, somehow, you know, and found that, the actual parts. That's a arrangement, orchestration, whatever. It was so scary. It was so made. It was so created for her vocal and her incredible voice to be the most present mm-hmm. forefront in the forefront. Mm-hmm. And so those guys were brilliant in how it just, it, it almost felt like it was sort of, it, it, like it was almost like nature in the background, but it was orchestral. <laughs> and her singing, like sitting on this tractor. It was, or, it was, or was it like a, a cart? Was it a tractor or a cart that she's, no, it was a tractor because she picks up Toto and she puts him on the seat, mm-hmm, remember? Mm-hmm. It's, it was the, 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 the orchestration was just. It was like you put the wind, you put the breeze, the breeze, and it was so beautiful. It's just simple and yet so complex. What do you think, Larry? Did you think that too? No, I, it was an amazing thing to hear because it's very sparse, but yet uh, you know there's there's a certain presence to it, and of course you know oh. your experience doing so much musical theater, you know, and of course you know the material so well, so you know what to do with it. And, and it was just a very impressive piece for the audience and for the orchestra to play. And they loved playing it. I was daunted because of, you know, because of the Judy girl it isn't just when uh, I was asked to sing that, I was like, I can't sing, only Judy can sing that song. <laughs> yeah, it must be nerve- nerve-wracking to sing that song. Well, I was, I was nervous about it, but uh, Larry and Michael just sort of said, no. We find it's, <laughs> and again, and again, like he was saying, is how sparse it is. It's like something is better. Just don't try to embellish anything. Just mm-hmm. in the notes and, and live what the lyrics are, and it came out all right. And look what you got behind you. These incredible, these incredible musicians doing mm-hmm. this beautiful. Stuff. It's so so difficult and and nice at the same time with doing the concerts at the Arboretum is when we do the rehearsals, of course, there's no audience. It's just this big field with peacocks and guys <laughs> setting up tables. So for, for Karen and other Lots artists who are not used to it, they look out there and go, oh, what? <laughs> and, and then the next day they come out on the stage and just 5,000 people. Yeah, who are I, drinking, so that's nice. Yeah. But- being outdoors and singing out to people, sitting outdoors in a beautiful place like that, is the feeling is just miraculous. Mm-hmm. 
yeah, yeah. that that many people show up. It's, it's really amazing. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, Karen, now that, I mean, aside from the fact that you do, you, you know, Broadway shows when, when they happen and the concerts and your Zoom concerts, uh, hmm. I know you were also doing a lot of uh, Pops concerts when they when they come our way. And, uh, how, do, how do you enjoy doing like a Pops concert compared to working on stage? A Pops concert is, or a concert with orchestra, orchestra, it's, first of all, you don't anymore on Broadway for the musicians in the pit or on stage with you in a show on Broadway just because of the, the expense for the production, because that's not their main thing. They have so many other things that they have that they have to think about putting on a show. Whereas with the Pops concert, it is about the music. And you, as the vocalist, are bringing, are enhancing, or sort of like the, the cherry on top, but it's about the music. And so that's why, you know, they, that's what they're funded for, is to have incredible people playing with you, with you or on stage with you. And the only other experience that I've had that, that we have like a full orchestra, like in the old days that they had like maybe 36 to 40 pieces is at City Center Encores in New York, where they do the original orchestrations when they used to have, they could afford many, many musicians. Mm -hmm. But even then, it's still not the same as doing a piece like Over the Rainbow that you were talking about, where it was a film studio's orchestra. Which is bigger than any Broadway orchestra ever was. So it's, and it's even when it's a spare arrangement orchestration, you've got eight violins instead of four violins, and it's just, it's like you're in heaven. It's like <laughs> listening to, you know, the soundtrack of a movie score. It's, it, it's, it's so much richer and fuller. And also, on, but on the other hand, with a Pops concert, it's more immediate because you're doing it for the first time, you're not doing it. Whereas it's a Broadway show, you do like eight shows a week and you've been doing it for a while maybe. It's more the same, same, same thing, or not the same, but I mean, it's you're doing the same singing. And of course it's live every night, but you're sort of in a groove, whereas a Pops concert is, you're seeing this audience for the first time and it's like maybe you only get just one, one or two chances to do it. So it's a little bit more immediate, and uh, things happen. You know, <laughs> where there'll be a little bit more, uh, maybe more improvisational uh, talking between the conductor and the, the artist, or somebody will drop a mic, or somebody. You know, things, things happen. It's it's. Well, it's, it's it's not like a Broadway show where, we, as you were saying, eight performances a week, or we rehearsed it for four weeks before we went out of town. Uh, or did previews or like that, so we're familiar with the material. So it's a more spontaneous thing, but more casual at the same time as well. Yes, I mean, when I came to do the Pops in Pasadena, it was uh, at the Arboretum. It was we had a rehearsal that afternoon, or the rehearsal the day before, and then rehearsal that afternoon, and then we did it. Mm -hmm. and it was yeah, a full show with a lot of music, <laughs> and each each performer had just a you know a small amount of music with maybe three or four songs in, in total but still when it's just you out there on stage it's it's a it's an important moment and you better get it right <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and i don't have well, pages in front of me you know like musicians do it's like you're front and center and sort of like like i said cherry on top of the center. <laughs> Well, Karen, speaking of getting it right, I watched on YouTube your Tony acceptance speech and yeah. Contact. Can you talk about Contact? It's such a interesting show. Yeah, it was it was unusual in that it was not a live orchestra, mm -hmm. which was kind of a new uh, way of putting on a musical. And it's and not really a musical, is it? It's, it's well, kind of. Kind of. I mean, it was. It was as far as the Tony Awards, that they they finally agree that it was yes because it was uh, it was musical and <laughs> uh, danced and acted and it was 
you know, the, 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 of course the characters were live, but it was canned music. So it was, it was, it was a difficult thing as far as all of our, you know, all of our musicians were concerned. And it was weird in that way. Um, it was kind of like kind of the first of its kind to be on Broadway and of that stature, because it still was an incredible, it was an incredible evening of theater. But the show itself uh, was uh, uh, three very interesting stories that uh, people really dug. They really liked it. Hmm. And, uh, so it, it and basically work. told through dance. Yes. So, well, so tell me, what's it like when you're at the Tonys and you hear your name called? That must be. <laughs> it's felt <that> very validating. <laughs> yeah. um, I had been nominated for a Tony Award prior to that, um, a couple years before. Was it a couple years before that? Yeah, uh, three years before that. So I had been in that position in the past, but this was, of course, my first. So I'm actually getting to walk up and. <laughs> well, you know, you know, Karen, I'm a three-time Tony loser, so I <laughs> I don't I don't know the good feeling. I just you're not. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. One baby. I was the Susan Lucci of orchestra. <laughs> well, about when you, I know this is making it any better, but so, you see so so much, so many times you see like three time Tony nominee Larry Blank. I mean that looks pretty cool. Mm -hmm. It's always nice to be invited to the party. That, that's the good part. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's the best part of all of it, and and you know you know that too from from even when we did Teddy and Alice, which was. Uh, not the greatest success of all time. Mm -hmm. it, it was a great show to be part of with, with all the people involved. Mm -hmm. it was, it was, it was, I would think it was very underrated to play the truth. I agree with you. It, it, unfortunately, we opened the same season as Phantom, you know, and uh, we, <laughs> we were sitting at the, the Minskoff Theater and uh, Cabaret came into town, a revival with Joel Gray and they just couldn't afford to move us is really what happened. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Because yeah. Len Carey was fantastic in the show. It was the music of John Philip Sousa. Yeah. And, and it was not a bad show. No, I oh, I love some of that music. It's incredible what they, how they took those tunes and made them into new songs. Was, yeah. I <laughs> loved uh, Hal's lyrics. They were very clever and romantic. And, and everybody in it was terrific. Beth Fowler and Ron. It was a great, it was a great group of people. It was about Teddy Roosevelt. I mean, so. so Teddy Roosevelt. And, and his daughter Alice, you know, so uh, it, it was quite an interesting little story. But as I said, when, when you bring a show like Phantom in, nothing else is matters. I know. <laughs> I think it's everything. It really is. <laughs> you know, most people don't realize that the season that West Side Story opened, uh, Music Man opened, and the winner of all the Tony Awards was Music Man. Hmm. West Side Story did not win. Crazy. It's timing. So, Karen, um, you're a dancer first, correct? Or, or is that how you... Age, when I was a little girl, yes, I started hmm. dancing. Ballet. Very young. Hmm. Yeah. So, you kind of have, I mean, if you're going to be professionally you gotta have to start here. You have to dance. Yeah. It's uh it's not you, you don't learn it very quickly. She's a pretty good singer, you know? Yeah, I heard and some very, very good singer and, stuff. And, a, and a very fine actress. So so a triple threat. Well I we I always sang when I was I did take a lot of dance lessons, but when I was um, growing up we also sang a lot and I did a lot of as they say, I used to dance around the living room. I used to do a lot of that. <laughs> so I felt confident singing because all the singing I did growing up along with the dancing. Mm. So it sort of just melded together and I was really fortunate. Now, where did you grow up? In Michigan. Ah, okay. <laughs> That's... So, 
And then maybe tell us a little bit of how you got into Broadway. How did that happen? Um, well, my, my grandma, Winifred Height, she sang with New York City Center Opera. So there was always, my mother was always very influenced by you know, classical music and film music. And, and she always wanted to dance. And so she never got to, but she gave it to me when I came along. And so not only was I influenced with the ballet, I was influenced with uh, watching a lot of movie musicals. Uh, we would go to local plays. Uh, I was in involved in getting into the musicals at school. And so when I, um, after I graduated from college and I really became a pretty, pretty good ballet dancer, I wanted to be a, like in a, a dance company. I wanted to be a concert dancer. And little did I know, realized that that wasn't going to be my track at all, mm. because there's so much, there's so much more to express yourself in actually singing and talking and telling jokes and stuff like that. Wait, and tell so, me before you go on, what's your dream ballet role? Ballet role? Mm -hmm. Oh gosh, I, there's so many of them. I always loved Swan Lake, mm -hmm. but but uh, some of the some of the action roles, some of the, the uh, the roles I remember watching, like Makara Vadu and, and uh, Cynthia Gregory, when I was growing up, they were the big stars mm -hmm. in New York. Uh, Suzanne Farrell mm -hmm. were like the kind of, kind of very diva-ish sort of Anthony Tudor ballet roles, which were more the kind of you know sad, like Fall River Legend, which was about Lizzie Borden. So like, I like those too. The kind of mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so go on. T sorry, before I interrupted about your getting into Broadway. Oh, but yes, but so but because I had all that great dance training and I love to sing, it was it was a no brainer that hmm. I would start doing that kind of live theater, and I, I was a good tap dancer too. I had kind of all the skills in the dance department. So uh, my mother wanted to be Eleanor Powell reincarnated but she couldn't so she sent me to tap classes and I learned how to do it. <laughs> Thank God and it, so that helped me you know I got into 42nd Street and Crazy For You and all those tap dancing sort of shows and kind of like started to dom with the domino effect and you just you work for a lot of the same people um, if they like you if they get along with you if they say do this and you do it and you at least try it and don't say no uh, they're like I like that person. We'll put her on our team. A lot of it is all about just saying yes and and falling on your face a lot. Mm. Also, you know, Broadway uh, when we were coming up was all uh, becoming choreographer, director driven. Mm. So the choreographers were, were hiring the best dancers they could get to do their shows. Uh, I know because you know I was fortunately conducting most of those things like chorus time. You know, no, no, Nanette and the tap shows and stuff like that, and and that's how we all met. You know. Well, Larry, okay. conducting a musical that's high, that with a lot of dancing, it's similar to ballet, right? I mean, you have to be right on, or the dancers. Well, you, you're, you're supposed to be. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, ballet, you have to be right on. But but it was the same thing. The conductors, like myself, were usually hired by the choreographers. Mm. So, because they were the directors, so there's Susan Stroman and there's Michael mm -hmm. Bennett in his day, and Pat Birch and Larry Fuller, and uh, even going back to Ron Field when I saw yeah, him. You have to have a good reputation as a conductor of dance mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. get hired because it's, it's imperative that you stay with the tempos, but also, too, you have to keep, especially if there's tap dancing in the show, tapping is, is very percuss is percussive. So, tapping will speed. Uh, um, an orchestra up. If the tap dancers are getting really good at their tapping and they've been doing it for a year, they're like, see through it and keep it. Keep it, you're right. I often tell the story, uh, I was conducting for Tommy Toon for a while, and um, uh, I had done Sugar Babies with Ann Miller. Like that, but I said to Tommy one day, I'm sorry I was a little slow tonight. He said, well, well, Larry, if you don't get the tempo you love, you better love the tempo you get. <laughs> <laughs> so so when the lights come back on 
uh, <laughs> zoom what, turns what, off. Oh my God, what, what, what's uh, what? Do you have any specific projects ahead of you? You know, I was supposed to do uh, right now. I was supposed to be in San Francisco doing a production of Follies. Let's see, Steve. Oh, wow. Oh. I'm looking so forward to that. Uh, and that may still happen in the, in the future if this company decides to do, do it again, or, or to continue on with what they were planning on doing anyway. You just don't know if theater companies are even going to be able to survive through this. Mm -hmm. Of course. So, cross your fingers. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to doing that show sometime. And, mm -hmm. But as far as that actual happening, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. We would like to. But other than that, no, there's nothing definitely planned. I was working um, on something with John Kander uh, recently <laughs> uh, that uh, it was scotched, and it was just you know just a little uh, reading we were doing. But it's you just keep you just keep on doing it, and if you hope it comes back, and if not, hopefully it'll be something else. Karen, didn't you get to do Mrs. Lovett in Sweeney Todd? I did. I was. Uh, recently at Michigan Opera Theater, went back to my... Um, with Ron, wasn't Ron yeah. in it? Went back to my state, home state of Michigan, with Michigan Opera Theater in Detroit, at the Detroit Opera House, and played Mrs. Lovett. Ron Raines was our Judge Turpin. He was scary and wonderful. I bet he was. <laughs> Al was uh, played with Sweeney. He was terrific. Uh, it was, that was a wonderful experience. Yeah, it's a great piece. So, one of his masterpieces. He's got a couple men, a few masterpieces, but that one is like that one's indescribable. No, it's I felt the same way. You know, hmm. it's uh, I, I would have liked to have seen you do it because I you know, uh, it, it takes all of the, the rhythmic abilities you have as a dancer and a singer and you know yes. to pull that I, stuff off. You know, I never thought that, you know, when I first saw the show, you know, you don't picture yourself as a, as a young person like you know, seventy nine Eighty when I was coming into New York at that time and seeing somebody up there playing that role, you think, "Oh, I'm going to play that role someday." Because <laughs> you know, it's a, a you know a character woman of a certain age, and but then all of a sudden you are that person. And the the other part that I was always impressed that you did, and, and I didn't get to see it unfortunately because I think I was traveling with something, but I heard it was when you did uh, One Ten in the Shape. Mm -hmm. It's such opera. a great part, but I wanted to point out to everybody that these are singing and acting roles. You weren't mm -hmm. hired as a dancer; you were hired for your for your acting abilities and and your singing. And they're very difficult parts. Oh. <laughs> there you are. Part Edith Benson, the original Lizzie Curry in One Ten in the Shade on Broadway. She was uh, a lyric soprano. Wonderful actress too, great stage actor, you know, a legit actress too. But she, her tessitura was very high. Tessitura was very high, and I'm more kind of in that middle soprano range. So it was it was challenging for me. Uh, but the role itself was came from a play, The Rainmaker. So it really was a, a very fleshed out role, and so it wasn't just about the singing; it was also about you know, the relationship with the brothers and the story and the father and, of course, the love interest. <laughs> I hate to admit it, but I actually saw the original show uh, as, as a small child in New York City. Well, what did you think? Well, it, it, it was, uh, it's funny because I was a great fan of Schmidt and Jones and I ended up conducting one of their shows later. But, mm -hmm. but um, and our dear friend Don Pippen and my mentor conducted it originally uh when the show was was originally done it, it was kind of lightweight i meaning uh the play the rainmaker a very strong play but when they made the musical it, it was very light compared <laughs> to, to the writing and, uh -huh. and ingus swenson was fantastic but but it, it was more about the singing than anything else at that time hmm. just the nature of the production it sounded fantastic, and of course, when you did it, City Opera, they enlarged the orchestra, so it was really uh, yeah, That was a pretty large orchestra, too. So yeah. What was wonderful about working at New York City Opera is that for my grandmother, who sung 
who played Carmen in Amaris and, and, hmm. and the late Delilah, as she called it, Delilah. She was a contralto. Uh, so it was coming full circle that I was, I wasn't doing opera, but I was doing a musical, musical comedy. Pretty play. close. But the fact that, that I skipped a generation, but then I was stepping on that stage uh, anyway. Is That's it amazing. And you know who, who who saw my grandmother sing when he was a young man was John Kander because he's an opera aficionado and, and, yeah. and in Kansas City growing up they would go downtown and uh, see the opera and my grandmother toured in Carmen. You know, once you do a role, you do it all over the place. And uh, she came and he, I saw you. He knew more about it than I did. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is off camera, but I got to tell you a John Kander story. Okay. Uh, he, John told me this story. Uh, there was a show called An Evening with B. Lilly in the fifties, and it was a two piano team in in the pit. I cannot remember their name. I'm just having a little uh, brain fart. But it was a man and a woman. You know, it was it was like. Uh, Harold and Yolanda, I cannot remember the name. Very famous <laughs> thing. And they were supposed to go on the road with it and they turned it down, you know? So the two pianists who replaced Harold and Yolanda were Don Pippen and John Kander. <gasps> and John Kander <laughs> told me they're sitting in the pit playing the show because they were great friends in those days doing summer stock together. Both. They were both fantastic piano players. And John told me someone leans over and taps him on the shoulder and says, which oh, one I'm missing, is... I'm missing, I can't hear you. He says, someone taps him on the shoulder in the audience, John, and says, which one of you is Yolanda? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and John went... <laughs> <laughs> Great little story. So. Uh, Karen, thank you so much. This has been great. Great talking to you guys. Nice to meet you. Bye. Alrighty, bye. Yeah. bye. bye. Happy little bluebirds fly 
Peace.